from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library, and I'm pleased to welcome you to another in our series of Books and Beyond talks about volumes and authors who are based at the Library of Congress, both the collections and, in this case, the authors. The Books and Beyond series does focus on any kinds of books that have a Library of Congress connection. And it's a real pleasure to be able to really get down to the raw stuff here, looking at the materials in the Library of Congress that relate, in this case, to World War II. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I want to say a couple of uh, points about our presentation. Uh, first of all, we'd like you to turn off all things electronic. Uh, we are filming this presentation as we do other presentations for later viewing and uh, hearing on the Library of Congress website. Uh, secondly, we are going to have book sales, but the book sales will be starting uh, after the presentation begins and they will continue afterwards. And the signing, you'll be able to buy the books. Excuse me, sorry. Okay. You'll be able to, to uh, purchase the books uh, outside and come back in to have them signed. Uh, what we're celebrating today is really not only the Library of Congress, the book 365 Days, talking about World War II, but also uh, books that are part of a continuum, and in many ways it's a continuum that has been uh, anchored and sparked by the chief editor and organizer of today's volume and three previous volumes that I've hauled out of my office uh, in order to uh, take a look quickly at our resources. Uh, today's book, Three, World War II, 365 Days, has been preceded by projects organized by senior editor Margaret, also known as Peggy Wagner, in the publishing office. Uh, Peggy has, since I've, we have our old friends, and I've known Peggy as sort of the war expert in Library of Congress resources, and she certainly has proven that just in recent years, uh, not only with this book, but with the Library of Congress World War II Companion, which was published by Simon & Schuster in 2007. Again, Peggy is the lead editor, but she organizes teams to put these books together, and it's really quite a remarkable achievement. And certain members of the teams are in the audience today, but we won't break that down. She brings in the resources that are needed to do the job. Uh, previously, uh, the Peggy pulled together a book called The Civil War Desk Reference, which was published in 2002 uh, by Stonesong. And it, its companion volume is the preceder, actually the volume preceding this particular three, it's The Civil War, 365 Days. So you have before you uh, quite an organized effort at looking at the Library of Congress's uh, resources and putting them into book form. Uh, Peggy herself has been an editor here for a number of years. Uh, she has worked with many staff members. And outside of these four books, which we'll be celebrating today, particularly looking at the World War II books, I also want to thank her for being the editor for a couple of my books through the years. And that was uh, a way that uh, I learned to be the meticulous writer than I now am by having an editor uh, like Peggy. Uh, Peggy uh, is joined today by Athena Angelos from the uh, publishing office, who is the uh, really a picture editor, and I've worked with Athena in the past, and Tom Weiner from the Veterans History Office, who is going to be our third and final speaker. But uh, we're going to start uh, with Peggy Wagner, who is going has a prepared presentation, and she has assured me that this has been a, it's a well edited presentation, <laughs> and that it will go quickly. And I'm pleased to present uh, Margaret Peggy Wagner. Peggy. Do you want this book here? Oh, no, I've got one. Okay. You've seen it. I have seen it. Thank you very much. My first question is, can you all hear me? <laughs> um, good. Um, I want to thank John, and I'd also like to thank Anne Bonnie and Stacias 
uh, Sister and Guy Molinara of the uh, Center for the Books Dauntless uh, team for co-sponsoring this event and for scheduling it so appropriately close to the Memorial Day commemoration. Um, I'd also like to salute my publishing office colleagues sitting over there. Um, they are themselves a great team, and as John mentioned, many of them worked with me, um, as did Athena, on some of these other books that we produced. This, I should explain that the image up on the screen, um, someone just asked me if it was the cover of the book, and it is not. It is the title page of the book. It's an image that's so very strong. It's from our prints and photographs collections. And the designer of the book liked it so much that he put it as the title page of the book. I am going to start our presentation tonight, or this afternoon, by introducing you to a person that I've come to think of as a respected acquaintance, even though, uh, regretfully, I have never met him. This is U.S. Marine uh, World War II U.S. Marine Eugene Sledge. In the year 2002, his second volume of World War II memoirs was published posthumously. His first book, With the Old Breed in Pulelu in Okinawa, is justly considered a classic. But in the second volume, China Marine, Sledge said something about his experience getting back into civilian life right after the Second World War that made a very big impression on me. And I included the, um, this quotation in the book. I was totally unprepared for how rapidly most Americans who did not experience combat would forget about the war, the evils we faced, and how incredibly tough it had been for us to defeat the Japanese and the Nazis, he wrote after describing an encounter with a particularly obtuse college registrar. I felt like some sort of an alien, and I knew and I realized that this sort of thing would confront me for the rest of my life. World War II is much farther away now it's much more difficult for us to look beyond the myths and misapprehensions and glimpse the terrors and complexities of this huge conflict that changed the world and profoundly altered the role of the United States within it. It was most appropriate then for the Library of Congress, the nation's memory, repository of vast World War II materials and home of the Veterans History Project, to collaborate with Harry N. Abrams in the publication of this aptly nicknamed Brick Book, which, as you'll find out when you pick it up, is good for muscle tone as well as the mind. <laughs> it holds, by recent official count, 571 illustrations almost all of them drawn from the Elsie collections, which were, of course, also the principal source for the many quotations from wartime figures, both celebrated and unsung, that laced through the text. You'll meet only a very few of these individuals in the warp speed, chapter by chapter tour of the book that I'm about to take you through before turning the proceedings over to Athena Angelos and then Tom Wiener. Please bear two things in mind. First, um, all the illustrations that you'll see are in the book, but in preparing for this presentation, we both downloaded and scanned so that the images on the screen are of a variety of qualities. The images in the book, however, are all uniformly beautifully reproduced. Second, each chapter in the book covers a wide variety of events and aspects of the war, much, much more than we can talk about uh, this afternoon. 
Now, in keeping with the general 365 days format, which is the format that Abrams adopts for all their bricks book, brick books, the book is arranged into 12 chapters. The first of these, Prelude, reviews the events and conditions that led to the war. World War II began only about two decades after the conclusion of what was once called the Great War of 1914-1918, a conflict considered so horrible by those who survived it that they believed it had to be the war to end all war. This prayer, published in 1924 by the Women's Pro League of Nations Council of New York, reflects the determination of so many people around the world to find a path to permanent peace. The prayer reads in part, Grant unto us such clear vision of the sin of war that we may earnestly seek that cooperation between nations which alone can make war impossible. Cooperation was not foremost in all minds, however. It was in part the reverberations from what we now call World War I, exacerbated by the traumas of the worldwide Great Depression that led to the rise of Benito Mussolini and the fascists in Italy and Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in Germany. Here we see Hitler in the center in a dark suit and Mussolini in his characteristic hands-on-hips pose in 1934 during the political courtship that preceded formation of what Mussolini dubbed the Axis Alliance. By the 1930s, as Italy invaded e Ethiopia and both Italy and Germany brutally intervened in the Spanish Civil War of 1936-1939, the military had become the most powerful force in Japan where many had come to resent Western attitudes reflected in such actions as passage of the U.S. Oriental Exclusion Act in 1924. In this 1941 image published in Tokyo, Emperor Hirohito on a white horse reviews his troops as Japan embarks on a quest to establish its own empire in the East as a source of economic and political power and as a means of breaking Western influence in Asia. The next chapter, Wars East and West, covers the trauma-filled years 1937-1939, when the world still struggling with the effects of the Great Depression saw full-scale war break out between Japan and China in July 1937. The Japanese believed that this would be a short and profitable conflict. It was to last for eight devastating years. Here, artist, Japanese artist Tenkyo Ota depicts the Shanghai conflagration, a scene from only one three-month battle in, in, in 1937. This battle killed hundreds of thousands of people and there was much worse to come. In Spain, Hitler's Luft Luftwaffe led the merciless aerial bombing attack on the Basque city of Guernica in April 1937, a raid that appalled the international community and did much to bring anti-fascists from around the world to fight against Spain's fascist leader, Francisco Franco and his German and Italian allies. Nurse Solaria Key, whose picture you see here, served with the American Medical Bureau in Spain. Wounded and furloughed home, she later traveled throughout the US urging African Americans to support the anti-fascist forces fighting what she termed the enemy of all racial minorities, fascism, and its most aggressive exponents, Italy and Germany. In the meantime, Hitler continued the political maneuvering that resulted in the creation of so-called Greater Germany 
as Austria then Czechoslovakia fell under Nazi control. Then in September, on September 1st, 1939, the German Führer launched a full-scale military attack against his next target, Poland. Portrayed in this poster by artist, Polish-American artist Arthur Schick as St. George battling a dragon. The attack on Poland led Britain and France to declare war on Germany. Americans now looked with apprehension at the conflicts blazing across both their flanking oceans. Blitzkrieg covers the tumultuous year 1940, when in April and May, Hitler emphatically ended the relatively peaceful phony war period by first invading Denmark and Norway, <coughs> and then making the big push into the Low Countries and France. That push was so successful, the fall of France, a supposedly well-armed and invincible country, was particularly shocking, that masses of people began to believe the highly exaggerated rumors about a so-called fifth column of spies and sympathizers who helped the German invader. The British, who now stood alone against the Nazis and faced the threat of imminent invasion, began wondering what the 60 to 75,000 Germans, Austrians, and Italians then living in Britain might do. In June, their fifth column fears led them to intern thousands of aliens, including uh, Jewish refugees from Germany, some of them in cordoned off townships like the one you see pictured here. That same month, the United States passed a controversial piece of legislation. The Alien Registration Act, or Smith Act, required the registration and fingerprinting of all aliens living in the United States. An even more controversial piece of legislation was enacted a few months later. Condemned by its opponents as legislation that would subject American youth to syphilis and slavery, the Selective Service Act of September 1940 instituted the first peacetime draft in U.S. history. Here, General Lewis B. Hershey participates in a Selective Service lottery in Washington, D.C. A global conflict covers the year 1941. For 11 months of that year, the U.S. remained officially non-combatant. But a few American aviators, including these men, photographed in March 1941, and all of them are identified in the book, bucked official U.S. neutrality by joining the British Royal Air Force, which formed three all-American Eagle squadrons. Generally, however, Americans still hoped to stay out of the shooting war, although they were increasingly more willing to support those fighting the Axis by measures short of war, including through the uh, Lend-Lease program, which was established in March. The chapter looks at battlefield action in North Africa and Greece, where this picture was taken, and at Hitler's abrupt termination of his brief and world-shocking alliance with the Soviet Union by means of a massive German invasion of that huge country on June 22nd. It also traces the political negotiations and military planning in both the United States and Japan that preceded Japan's surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor where this picture was taken of the burning battleship US, USS West Virginia. That attack instantly transformed the United States into a combatant in what was now a global war. Allies versus Axis is one of several thematic chapters or interludes, each of which examines a particular aspect of the war rather than the events of a specific year or years. This chapter looks at some of the major characters involved in and some of the differences and different characteristics of the Allied and Axis alliances. In this May 1942 drawing, United Nations, 
Miguel Covarrubias depicts in glowing colors the leaders of 26 allied nations that had signed the declaration by the United Nations that January, featuring front and center in the first row, the big two, Roosevelt and Churchill, flanked by Chiang Kai-shek and Joseph Stalin, who with them made up, unsurprisingly, the big four. Artist Saul Steinberg forswore color and used wry humor to depict Axis leaders in this drawing titled Balance of Nations, each leader doing his own thing as the group hangs together over a very unfirm foundation consisting of a keg of dynamite, a rifle, and um, a cannonball with a lit fuse, materials appropriate to both their internal and external relations. Yet in the beginning, the Axis seemed absolutely invincible. Axis Ascendant outlines the events of 1942, as Germany's Wehrmacht maintained its stranglehold in Western Europe and forced its way deeper into the Soviet Union, and the Japanese captured one allied bastion after the other. Suffering bitter losses in the Pacific from the Philippines to Guam, the United States scrambled to train and field armed forces and accelerate the building of ships and planes that would be used to deploy them around the world. At the same time, fears of a Japanese landing on the West Coast, racial prejudice, and apprehensions about a fifth column activity contributed to a decision for which the United States government has since attempted to make amends. After President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19th, more than 100,000 West Coast Japanese and Japanese Americans, including this family being forced from their home on Bainbridge Island, Washington, were interned in camps under military guard. Of course, the Japanese never even attempted a West Coast landing, although some of their submarines did take pot shots at the coast. And the United States gradually mustered its forces and began to strike back at Japan and its Axis partners. American submarines were in Japanese waters in January. In April, Jimmy Doolittle led his famous bombing raid against Tokyo. In early August, U.S. Marines landed on Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. And on November 8th, General Dwight D. Eisenhower headed the first large-scale combined Anglo-American operation of the war, when the largest amphibious op invasion force in history to that time swept into western North Africa. Here we see GIs battling snipers on the streets of Algiers. The second interlude, Total War, focuses on the conflict's pervasiveness, reaching into nearly every aspect of life. This 1942 photograph by Arthur Rothstein of a mural in New York City's Grand Central Station represents, among many other things, the staggering economic costs of the conflict. Aerial warfare, which was in its infancy during the 1914-18 conflict, came into full and massively destructive flower during World War II, and it is a presence in every chapter of this book. Early on, it was by no means certain that the United States mainland would escape the kind of aerial bombardment that the Axis had visited on cities from London and Belgrade to Chongqing. Thus, camouflage, a wartime art form around the world, became an art form practiced here, too. This 1943 photo by Marjorie Collins shows a camouflage class at New York University. Beyond and behind the war of bombs and bullets, World War II was fought in libraries and radio stations, hospitals and science labs, on farms and in factories, and as this poster for a somewhat less than classic British movie and Japanese artist Shansui Hagashimoto's depiction of people watching a newsreel attest on movie screens. 
The tide begins to turn covers events in 1943. As fighting continued in the China-Burma-India theater, the Allies maintained their long campaign in New Guinea, while their naval and ground forces kept pushing slowly from island to island in the Pacific, painfully and at enormous cost. This photo shows U.S. Marines slogging through knee-deep mud in Bougainville. Mud, bugs, razor-sharp grass, and disease were additional enemies that both sides had to fight in the Pacific campaign. In Europe, the Red Army achieved one of the turning points of the war with their hard-won victory at Stalingrad and followed that up with a victory at the Battle of Kursk, which included the war's largest clash of armored forces. This vivid sketch of, Hitler's, of one of Hitler's tanks in action is by German war correspondent Hans Liska. Farther south, after the Allies pushed Axis forces out of North Africa and liberated Sicily, Mussolini's government fell. Hitler rushed major reinforcements to Italy, assuring that the Allies would face a long and difficult campaign after they made their initial landings there in September. Two African-American units of the segregated American Armed Forces, the 92nd Infantry Division and the 332nd Fighter Group, served with valor in Italy, fighting racial prejudice at the same time they were battling the Nazis. Meanwhile, racial tensions also resulted in fighting on the U.S. home front, where in 1943, race riots erupted on military bases from Georgia to California. Among civilians, <coughs> excuse me, in Mobile, Alabama, Beaumont, Texas, and most bloodily in Detroit, and between civilians and off-duty soldiers and sailors in the notorious Zoot Suit riots in Los Angeles, during which this picture was taken. Excuse me one moment. The Allies Close In considers the pivotal year 1944, a year of important and very risky Allied landings. January saw the start of a bitter months-long campaign to take the town of Casino, Italy, and adjacent Monastery Hill during which Peter, PFC Peter San Filippo created this watercolor depiction of a hit on an ammunition dump. In June, the, the Allies enjoyed, enjoyed a wild Italian welcome when they took Rome, but news of that victory was quickly eclipsed by word that the long-awaited Allied invasion of France had at last begun. D-Day, June 6th was an all-out gamble made successful by the courage and tenacity of Allied troops in the face of what American D-Day veteran Tracy Sugarman has termed a deadly tapestry of chaos and carnage. 21-year-old Private First Class Jesse Beasley survived the landing on what came to be known as Bloody Omaha Beach where Walter Rosenblum took this picture of men attempting to help some of the thousands of wounded. Beasley later recalled seeing horribly wounded soldiers begging for help. They'd just look at you with a pitiful look, he said, because you couldn't do nothing for them. There was mortar shells coming in on us, artillery shells, machine gun fire, everything imaginable, right on you. That fall, General Douglas MacArthur began to make good his pledge to retake the Philippines with landings at the island of Leyte, where this a U.S. Coast Guard photographer took this photo of men unloading landing ship tanks, or LSTs. This was only the very first step in a difficult and staggeringly costly campaign that was to last well into the summer of 1945, as other Axis forces continued their perilous progress toward Japan. The most terrible conflict focuses on the m multiple costs and horrors of the war, 
from the ravages of the battlefield and the almost unimaginable firestorms caused by massive aerial bombing, through the sufferings of military prisoners of war and people forced to live under Axis occupation, to war crimes and the unprecedented crime against humanity now known as the Holocaust. The grimness of this chapter, perfectly represented by Beatrice S. Levy's 1943 print, River of Blood, is alleviated by examples of inventiveness, compassion, and stunning courage. Unconditional Surrenders outlines the events of 1945. This photo by Tony Frizzell of USGI's grabbing a few minutes rest in Western Europe, representing all the bone-tired members of Allied Armed Forces who began the year still slugging it out with Axis troops from Italy to Okinawa. In the spring, not long before Hitler's suicide and Germany's surrender, U.S. troops began opening the gates of Nazi concentration camps and seeing for themselves the irrefutable evidence of the slave labor and organized mass murder that were the hallmark of the Third Reich's so-called New Order in Europe. This photo of liberated inmates of the Eben Sea concentration camp was taken by Staff Sergeant Charles M. Amsler of the U.S. Third Army Medical Corps. After the German surrender, many GIs were slated to be transferred to the Pacific to join in what Allied ward planners expected would be a prolonged and bloody campaign to take the Japanese home islands, set to commence in November. But months of conventional bombing and two atomic bombs brought the war in Asia to a close in August. U.S. Navy Lieutenant Robert L. Balfour was present at the main surrender ceremony aboard the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, and he received this certificate to commemorate the occasion. The main, sh <coughs> excuse me, the main shooting war was over, but much of the world was in terrible shape, physically and economically. In some regions, civil wars or national upri nationalist uprisings had already begun or were on the verge of breaking out. And there was a deepening and dangerous rift between the Western powers and the Soviet Union. The book concludes with a consideration of the continuing aftermath of the war. In addition, <clears throat> to the political and economic reverberations. There were, excuse me, there were, of course, more personal after effects. I had not intended to do this. <coughs> These photographs show some of the remarkable work done by U.S. Army surgeons but they cannot show us the mind or emotions of this wounded man. USO sketch artist, <coughs> excuse me, USO sketch artist Mimi Korach Lesser, who drew the portrait of PFC Oakley Gifford on the right, provided a testament to the spirit of similarly wounded men when she reported on her experience in a hospital specializing in plastic surgery. The veterans were disbelieving that an artist would want to draw them, she said. So it took great daring for a GI with half his face disfigured to approach me with bravado and ask what I was going to do about him. Posing him with his good side facing me, I was able to sketch what his face would look like after rehabilitation was complete. Talk about success. This opened up a stream of eager, brave, sad men. Now they could have pictures sent to their loved ones that were positive. World War II, 365 days, 
ends with this photo of veterans Richard Kozad and Kenneth Johnson, taken by LC staff member Michaela McNichol at the dedication of the World War II Veterans Memorial on Memorial Day weekend, 2004. Two years later, a number of U.S. World War II vets traveled to France to attend the ceremonies commemorating the 60th anniversary of the D-Day landings. To see this beach where many, <clears throat> to see this beach where many friends lost their lives gives me chills, veteran Ken Ewing told an Associated Press interviewer. And it makes me think we should never forget. We must never forget. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to Athena. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. I want to especially thank John Y. Cole from the Center for the Book for hosting this and many other interesting events here at the library. Also thanks to Tom Weiner from the Veterans History Project who will be up right after me. Um, I also have to thank everyone from the publishing office. It's a wonderful group of people that are always very supportive and full of good cheer. And this project was done on a very um, short time frame. So um, all the help that we got was greatly appreciated. This book would not have been possible without the many talents and collections acumen of the many librarians, reference staff, catalogers, and digital imaging experts, especially of the prints and photographs division. I'm especially grateful to Margaret E. Wagner for inviting me to join her on this terrifically challenging and extremely rewarding collaboration. Give me a second to look at that. So this cartoon is not in our book, but I think it captures, I think it captures how Peggy and I felt at times towards the challenge before us, that of telling the story of World War II as completely, accurately, and compassionately as we could in pictures and in words in 365 increments. Whilst 365 pages may seem like a lot more than what Peppermint Patty got here, um, Peggy and I can still confirm that it's peanuts. <laughs> I married a punner. <laughs> this is especially true when culling from the vast and diverse collections of the Library of Congress. Today I'd like to share a bit about um, our collaborative process of researching, selecting, and arranging what turned out to be, as Peggy said, 571 images used in this book. I'll also highlight some of the sources and collections that were especially useful. I won't go into much detail about specific people and events because I think Peggy's wonderful text does that and we hope you, you'll buy the book. Um, this next image. This was also not in the book, but um, I think it can be good to see what didn't make it. Um, I, I, as the, an image researcher and the picture editor, I'm, I'm drawn toward the weird and wacky, like this coconut portrait of Hitler. Um, and fortunately, Peggy, who is a linear thinker, um, <laughs> unlike me, knew when a traditional portrait like this one of Spatz and Acre um, might better serve to carry our more serious narrative. But I liked the coconut. <laughs> she liked the coconut. We're going to get the coconut into something. And um, thoughtful collaboration is a wonderful thing. Here, sandwiched between General Stilwell and Lieutenant General Wiedemeyer is this fun, minimalist line drawing of Chiang Kai-shek by the artist Kovarubius. At the start of this project, we already had a sizable collection of material that we either hadn't been able to include in earlier World War II projects or that we hadn't been able to show in color. And here's an example of some leaflets that were produced by the U.S. Army Psychological Warfare Branch in 1944 and distributed in the Pacific Theater. Next is a, this is a, the black and white version of a silk screen entitled Fascism, and it's from the collection called the, from the Artists for Victory exhibition. 
And this is the earlier scan that you would have seen online for many years. And here's the color version that we were able to reproduce in the book. Um, if you haven't already noticed, uh, Peggy and I have very different styles of thinking and of taking in information. But I really believe that our different approaches only added to the richness of this very heavy book. Um, while we think all the images are strong, we hope you'll agree that the spreads, often combining different media, result in visually dynamic and contextually more complex presentations. Some of these can be seen with our use of posters and other media. So here we have a Civilian Conservation Corps poster um, on the left and a nice photograph of Roosevelt and other officials enjoying a lunch hosted at a CCC camp. This next spread from the Blitzkrieg um, chapter shows a soldier drawn by a German Jewish refugee child juxtaposed with a 1940 German poster that according to the cataloging translation, which I trust, um, accuses the Jews of starting the war and of perpetuating it. The Prints and Photographs Division has an excellent collection of World War II era posters covering a variety of promotional goals from all over the world. Here's one from Russia that we used in the Unconditional Surrenders chapter. The translation of the text is, So It Will Be With the Fascist Beast. And, ah, this poster also used in the Blitzkrieg chapter depicting the tragedy near Oran, Algeria, which Peggy spoke of. Um, we were just amazed when, when this dramatic French poster was discovered by Jan Grenchy of the Prints and Photographs Division. I couldn't find an a photograph um, depicting this exact occurrence and we were we were just so pleased because I think the drama relayed in the poster is much better than a black and white photograph would have been. This is also a Jan Grenchy find. Um, the request I gave her was bring out the weirdest World War II material you can find <laughs> and she came up with this. Um, and I think it kind of speaks for itself. It's a 1943 poster produced by the California Dairy Council. Next, I'll talk a little bit about photography. The following three images are from the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information Collection that forms an extensive pictorial record of American life between 1935 and 44. In total, the black and white portion of the collection consists of about 171,000 black and white film negatives, all of which can be viewed online. Here we have the Dorothea Lang photograph of a migratory field worker and his children at their home in California. This is used in the chapter that covers 1937 to 39. This is an official Navy photo of a convoy that was transferred to the OWI in 1944. And this, used in the Allies close-in chapter, is a 1944 photograph featuring um, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt enjoying a concert being given by Pete Seeger at uh, the opening of a United Labor, Labor Canteen Union in Washington. Another source of photography that I really like working with is the New York World Telegram and Sun Collection. Among the tens of thousands of prints that ran in the newspaper during the war years, many of them came from the Army Signal Corps or other government sources, although I find them somewhat easier to find um, in the New York World Collection than at the National Archives. And it also, the collection also includes many wire service images. This one shows, this is a Signal Corps picture of a Japanese Imperial Army commander as he's boarding the USS Missouri in September of 1945. That's, of course, in the surrender chapter. Um, this next shot is by a New York World staff photographer, and it shows the happy homebound troops arriving in New York Harbor in 1945. And this was also in the aftermath chapter. And I love this spread. Um, here we have a 1951 photograph of an Italian model showing off her atomic hairdo, and it's paired with the 1951 Atomic Bombing Care children's picture box, um, which the little um, knobs on the side you could wind and scroll through matching up pictures and words to learn good 
bomb shelter behavior. Um, also, obviously strong for World War II material from the German perspective is the library's Third Reich collection. If you enter Third Reich collection in the prints and photographs online catalog, you'll discover over 500 entries, most of which represent sets of images or multiple albums, documenting most aspects of the Nazi regime. Um, along with books and other printed materials that make up the so-called Hitler Library, these items were confiscated by U.S. military intelligence authorities and delivered to the library in 1946. Here's Hitler and his gang inspecting the newly conquered city of Paris in 1940. And I also really like this spread. On the left is a um, collage artwork by a child that's part of a collection of birthday greetings that were made for Hitler for his 44, 44th birthday. And on the right is um, a photograph from a sort of a commemorative Nazi album that is in the Rare Book Division and the Prints and Photographs Division. I'll quickly also share a little bit about some of the cartoon art that we used. Um, the Library of Congress is the proud keeper of the papers of and 1,700 original drawings by the beloved Bill Malden, Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist and Purple Heart recipient. Here he is on the right in his Stars and Stripes office in Rome, and the title of this cartoon is The Prince and the Pauper. Uh, um, this, this caricature of Stalin by the very talented German artist Joseph Planck, also known as Seppla, was used in the war's East and West chapter. The translation of the title is Reverie at a Moscow Fireplace. I also really like this spread. Um, on the left is a, a WPA poster for a Civil Liberties and War Times lecture in Iowa. And on the right is a William Groper cartoon depicting Lady Liberty being fingerprinted. Before I leave the prints and photographs division, I'll quickly share three more of our favorite spreads. Um, used in Wars East and West, a photo of Orson Welles on the left, who broadcast The War of the Worlds, written by H.G. Wells, who's rendered in right in a pastel drawing. Here we have a Tony Frizzell photograph paired with a Joan Gross Bettelheim lithograph, both illustrating home front experiences. And lastly, we have um, from the Tide Begins to Turn chapter, the surreal charcoal drawing by American folk artist John Kratke relating to the politics of Burma, along with a New York World photo of wounded Shindit raiders returning from the Burma campaign in 1943. Next, I'll show you two, visual, two examples of visual materials from the general collections. This is a great chart um, illustration from a Japanese publication, Victory on the March. Sometimes the artwork was on the outside. Um, here are two colorful soft back book covers that worked well together in the Total War section. We of course used several items from the Geography and Map Division. To help illustrate the Allies close in is this commemorative map of the 743rd Battalion's first 48 days at Normandy. There's a lot of really interesting information included in there. And here, th this spread shows another Tony Frizzell photograph of pilots receiving their precautionary escape kits that included the plane card escape maps that you see um, being demonstrated on the left. Finally, before I turn this over to Tom Weiner from the Veterans History Project, I'll show a few examples from that really special collection. This is a hand-drawn map by veteran James Brown recounting his experiences on Tarawa. And it is very clear in the book, um, all that tiny handwriting. This is a self-portrait and very lively drawing by noted author, illustrated, and friend of the library, the charming and esteemed Tracy Sugarman. And in closing, <laughs> that went fast. In closing, I'd like to thank everyone again and express my gratitude for being a part of this amazing project. I have a really great job, 
and the creation of this book with Peggy proved to be a powerful reminder that no matter how well we think we know our history, there are always other angles through words and images to be explored and considered. It seems fitting that I end with an image near and dear to me, and one which I hope, along with many other photos and several hundred letters, will someday be a part of the Veterans History Project. And this last, this last snapshot includes my mother, the then 23-year-old Mary Catherine McGar, second from the right, along with some of her Army Nurse Corps comrades of the 124th Evacuation Hospital somewhere in France in July of 1945. Thanks again so much for coming today. Please buy the book. And here's Tom. Thank you, Dr. Billington. Good friend of the Veterans History Project giving us our time. Um, I'm happy to be here and I'm very grateful to Margaret and to uh, Athena for inviting me to be part of this program. I, I just want to little, talk a little bit about who we are. I think probably 99 percent of the people in this room know who we are, but for the one person who doesn't or has a vague idea what the Veterans History Project does, we collect the first-hand accounts of veterans who served in the uniforms of the United States Armed Services from World War I through the current wars. We were created by Congress in the year 2000. Uh, a congressman came up with the idea, Ron Kind of Wisconsin. Uh, we started out as an oral history project. We've soon, we soon expanded into collecting letters, diaries, memoirs, um, photographs, two-dimensional artwork. We do not collect medals. We do not collect uniforms. We don't collect artifacts. We collect first-hand accounts of service in all of those wars, but of course, most especially, World War II. We have over 65,000 individual collections. Of those 65,000, over 6,000 are fully digitized, which means that the materials are available on our website for your examination. And I'm going to do a little demo of our website to show you how to find it. First of all, you can find it through the Library of Congress's uh, homepage here. We get a little billing up at the top there. So you can click on that and go to our home page. And on our home page, we have uh, information about the project, how to participate in the project. The project, as most of you know, is a volunteer-based project. We have people all over the country in organizations like Loudoun Valley High School, which is represented here by Marty Potts, a teacher at the high school. Her club out there interviews veterans. Uh, we also have uh, civic organizations, veteran service organizations, uh, and also individuals. Most of our collections come f are one-of-a-kind, one-off collections that come from people who say, I want to sit down with my uncle, my, my husband, my grandfather, and talk to him, or to my grandmother or my aunt or my niece about what they did when they served the United States Armed Forces in wartime. So if you go to our website, you can find out how to how to participate in the project, how you can get involved in the project. You can also pick up one of our brochures from the table here or the table in the corner and learn more about the project. You can also search the veterans collections from the, uh, the home page, and this is probably how Peggy and Athena did a lot of their research starting from here. You can find out, for instance, if you just limit your search to World War II, that we have 39,551 collections from World War II. Now you can also refine that search. Say you want all the people who served in the Navy in World War II, and so you can find out that we have 9,150 people who served in the Navy. How many of those are digitized? Well, you can limit it to that as well. And we have 838 digitized Navy World War II collections. Now, I can go on and on here. There's lots of different ways to slice this. But you get the idea that you can do kind of broad searches from, from this page. You can also do some interesting browsing. For instance, you can find out state of residence. How many collections do we have from people who were living in the state of Maine, for instance, when they were interviewed for the project? 148. Uh, that's uh, 
grants, uh, you know, out of 65,000. And uh, from the District of Columbia, 292. Also, on this browse page, you can search by race, race and ethnicity. So you can find out how many black and African Americans. Now, I should tell you that this is a voluntary category on our biographical data form. When you turn in a collection, you're to fill out a biographical data form with all the information about your service. This is a voluntary designation. We are urging people to, to fill this in because it gives us a more accurate portrayal of who served. But you can see we have 1,280 collections, black and African Americans, in World War II. Uh, another way you can look at the collections is through our Experiencing War feature. Every couple of months we choose a th common theme and we select a dozen or so collections from that theme to feature. Our current uh, theme is disabled veterans and there are several World War II vets in here including uh, Franklin Nicholson who was uh, wounded on Okinawa in the final days of that campaign and his face was severely injured uh, while he was on Okinawa and uh, went through life with the reconstruction and is in great shape now and did a great interview. Um, we're going, we also have other collections. As you see, we've done 24 previous releases, including a couple of World War II D-Day anniversary, which we did in 2004. We're going to update that and do a 65th anniversary next week. And among the D-Day collections, let's see, I think Tracy's in here somewhere. On the, you on the B? There he is. I wanted to feature Tracy because Tracy is like our favorite Veterans History Project collection. The reason Tracy's such a great collection is he's a triple threat. Tracy was a terrific interview and you can look at his interview, complete interview, on the website or you can actually look at highlights. And uh, Peter Bardis, who used to be with the project, is now we're in the American Folklife Center, did a terrific interview with Tracy. And, um, Tracy also was a fantastic letter writer. He wrote to his, his, uh, his sweetheart, June, and we have 271 of his letters, and they're all handwritten and they're beautifully composed. He was a fantastic writer. And, of course, Tracy was a fabulous artist, as we've already seen. And here's examples of some of his artwork and a lot of this material is uh, in the prints and photographs collection. So you can see how you can explore the project's holdings in a lot of different ways, and that's how they got to do a lot of their research. There's a second level of research you can do in the Veterans History Project. That is, you can call us and you can say, I have a more sophisticated search to do, and we will do that search in our database for you and come up with a list of collections that fit the criteria that you're looking for. So, that's my presentation today. Thanks for coming. I'm afraid we're going to have to change the order a little bit. Uh, we have had a wonderful program, but I'm going to, uh, we don't have time for questions, except we have time for the book signing out uh, where the books are being sold. And I'm going to ask both Peggy and Athena to step out there. There is a line waiting. Uh, the books, you could buy the books here. There's a very short line. And, uh, <laughs> and you'll get them for the same price as you can get with the employee discount downstairs, but it's more convenient to buy them now and to get them signed, and you can chat with our authors at that time. So let's conclude with a round of applause for this team effort. You know, they not only have once again shown how proud we should be of the collections of the Library of Congress on a specific subject, but how proud we could be of Library of Congress employees. You did a great job. Okay. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.